Welcome back to Movies TV Mad. You can follow me on Twitter at Movies TV Mad. Yes, please do smash the like button if you love me. Subscribe if you're new. Please have your say. And a very, very warm welcome to Sunday's edition of the DC Universe Daily. On today's packed show, we're going to give you some exciting updates because a couple of pages from the air cut script has leaked. And guess what? We're going to read them out here together on today's show very shortly. And David F. Sandberg reveals the original plan for Mr. Mind and Dr. Savannah in Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Very, very exciting. And in the final part of today's show, we're going to ask the question, what makes a great Superman movie? Are Warner Brothers, DC Studios and James Gunn actually capable of doing it. But what? That's the important question. What makes a great Superman movie? What's complicated about Superman? There's so many answers to that question. But first of all, a couple of the pages of the air cut from director David Ayer, his version of his original Suicide Squad movie, have leaked online. And we're going to give them both a read. So this should be very, very interesting because I haven't read them yet. I want to react to them together. So let's go. M more appended beds. Fear mad patterns still strapped to them. Guards use them for cover as they reload their pistols. Trading worried looks. Uh, a volley of gunfire rips through the beds. Patience and guards. Camera finds Dr. Harleen Quinzel, a beautiful young, uh, what's that? Psychiatrist. I thought he said say Austin. I, was, I said I can't read that. Lays on the floor, blonde, scared. A tall, muscular figure in a prison uniform looms over her. This is the Joker. Ripped like an MKA fighter, his skin is shock white. The, the, the cunning eyes of this grimming devil burn with malice towards all we hold dear. Dr. Quinzel, please don't, please, I did what you said, I helped you. Joker, you helped me by erasing my mind what few fading memories I had of who I was. You left me in a black hole of rage and confusion. That's the medicine you practice, Dr. Quinzel. Now, this is very interesting. We should stop there for a minute because this is evidence of what we've been saying. And a former account on Twitter called Mr. J, I think, who sadly passed away, was telling us this all the time. And he was right. What this script is saying is it's not the Joker who victimized Dr. Harley and Quinzel and made her Harley Quinn. Well, he does for revenge in this cut. But ultimately, she drew first blood. She, she literally wiped his mind. Now, what I'm not sure about is, did she do it? Was basically, did someone tell her to do it or did she do it on her own volition? Which is interesting. So actually, because we could literally wipe the minds of every single criminal in the real world, but we don't because it's unethical. What Harley has done here is unethical. So basically, the Joker is Harley's victim before Harley becomes the Joker's victim. Very, very interesting. They're the facts of that script. I read it, you heard it. You can't deny it. Now, this won't go well with the woke community because Waman never do nothing wrong, right? So anyway, his pale band, uh, what's that, proffers a rubber ball. He traces his long, sharp pinky nail along her lips. Joker continued, now let me help you into the same black hole. Open up, doll, and, and bite hard, or you'll break those perfect porcelain cap teeth when the juice hits your brain. She opens her mouth. He places the ball in it. He smears conductive jelly on two paddles, applies them to her temple. Joker continued, now forget you ever met me. She won't. She can't. She's in love with him. Shh, 
Dr. Quinzel convalesces as 450 volts sear through her brain. Her face contorted in agony, teeth grinding, the rubber ball. It stops. She goes, she goes slack. A tear falls from her open eye. Joker sets aside the paddles. Frost, his low aide, the camp, tosses hit him street clothes. Frost, good looking lady boss. She really liked you. So that's the first page. So let's go to the other page. If this dumb tablet lets me, bear with me. So I think, if I click the right one, here we go. So yes, Joker, it would never work. She kept trying to fix me. Frost, who said you were broken? Joker changes into a custom suit. Joker tattooed across his chest. A Joker playing card tattooed over his washboard abs. Frost screws his Glock in. Dr. Quinzel's ear, ear to finish her. Joker, rega Joker regarding this as he slips on his diamond J pinky ring. Then Joker smiles. No ordinary smile. It's the smile. The, the corners of his mouth slide up his face. A vast deadly Ritkus. A hyena smile. Inhuman. Insane. Predatory. Frost knows the smile and fears it. Frost holsters his Glock. In Bell Reeve, Harley's cage night. Clo close on two closed eyes. They snap open and stare at camera. Right into us. Bright with madness. Uncanny. Indimitable. Indomitable. In I can't even read that. Insatiant. The eyes of Harley Quinn. Camera rotates and pulls back. Harley hangs upside down from the ceiling of her steel cage. It's how, it's how she powerful Jim Carr's body as she languidly unfolds herself in a, in a demonstration of impossible demonic yoga. Her cage is inside a cell block. She has, she has to herself with uh, catwalks barbed wire. This supermax prison has been up, up armoured like a military firebase. A group of guards stands there watching her, waiting, ominously, outfitted like uh, black water in, in failure. They are fucking scared of her. Their redneck leader is Captain Griggs, a vain and tyrannical bureaucrat. Griggs, you know the rules, Hutness. Stay up the bars. You sleep on the floor, Harley. I sleep where I want, when I want, with who I want. Now that's part of the theatrical cut as well. Griggs, you're in my house, little missy. You break my rules, you pay me. He hits her. And that is the script leak from the air cut. Now, I apologise if my reading wasn't the best there, but it was really, really small and really, really hard to read. I thought I did okay. Personally, don't give me marks out of 10. It was bad, but we did it. But it was interesting. It was good. And the point I made about her wiping the Joker's mind, right, which he didn't like, he didn't take kindly to. So, yes, um, I look desperate to see the um, Suicide Squad, the air cut. Of course I am. I think we all are at this point. Some people just say, move on, move on. Well, I don't want to move on. Now, David has clearly le leaked these script pages. He's fighting hard. He really wants, with a passion for this movie, to be released. There's no question about that. And I want to see it. That sounds great, especially the first page I read out. It sounds very, very interesting. But let me know what you think. Would you like the air cut to be released. Maybe you don't care. If you're watching the live premiere, let me know in the comments beside me. If you're watching after the premiere, then comment down below and let me know what you think. But to be clear, I think this film will be released and David is now fighting hard to get it released. And I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be released. 
Now, David F. Sandberg has been explaining the original plans for Dr. Savannah and Mr. Mind in Shazam! Fury of the Gods. And this sounds like a better idea than squeezing them both in a piss-take, Mickey-take, humorous post credit scene. Now, the original idea is that Mr. Mind takes over Dr. Savannah's body. He uses his body to try to escape. He gets in a fight, but Dr. Savannah dies. Now, David F. Sandberg didn't want Savannah to die. Now, I understand this, David, but instead, we used the wrong villains in this movie. Now, I don't know if this means they were going to use Dr. Savannah and Mr. Mind a lot more in this movie. I don't know. It is my fault that, it's my opinion, that Dr. Savannah and Mr. Mind should have been the villains of Shazam! Fury of the Gods, which means it probably wouldn't have been called Fury of the Gods. Okay with me. I don't... Look, I love Dame Helen Mirren, I love Lucy Liu, they're fabulous, talented ladies. And they, they just didn't work. It's not the talent. Basically, I don't think Sandberg or the writing team pulled off their characters and made two respectable actresses. You know, Dame Helen Mirren's one of the best out there. She's an Oscar winner, of course. She made them look, basically, the writing team and Sandberg made them look like cringe and made them look like they couldn't act to save their lives. We know that's not the case. We know that Dame Helen Mirren is a critically acclaimed actor, but it didn't work. These villains didn't work. Rachel Zegler in this film was squeezed in this film because basically she's Steven Spielberg's, you know, new favourite actor. And Rachel Zegler is a solid vocalist and a solid actor, but she's not the bright new thing that everyone thinks she is, and I never want to see her in a DC movie as well. She's very, very arrogant, and she thinks she has the career of Julia Roberts. She's a very arrogant young woman who I've fallen out with on social media before because she doesn't understand. But anyway, she should have been in the film Dame Helen Mirren shouldn't have been in this film, and nor should Lucy Liu. This should have been a Mr. Mind and Dr. Savannah villain journey. It should have been the continuing story. And also, you would have had a lot of fun with Mr. Mind and Dr. Savannah as villains. That would have been a very, very interesting partnership. Much better than what we got in Shazam! Fury of the Gods. So that sounds damn good. Now, maybe that was just a post credit scene they were going to do. But he voted it down. He didn't want Savannah to die. I don't want Savannah to die anyway. Mark Strong's a great actor. Mark Strong was probably one of the best things about Shazam! Fury of the Gods. That's one of the defined differences from the first Shazam! and the sequel. The first Shazam! has, great, has a great villain. He has a great journey. We meet him as a small boy at the beginning of the film. It's quite sad what happens to him. He's emotionally abused by his father and brother and basically gets the chance to become the chosen one, but he hasn't got a pure heart and that drives him to villainy and madness. He murders his father and his brother later on in the movie. It's a great journey. These villains don't have a journey. Rachel Zegler's character doesn't have an interesting journey. She's just there. She's just pretty. She just looks good. And she falls in love with Freddie Freeman. And Freddie Freeman falls in love with her. It's nothing. It's enough. There's nothing deep about this movie. The first movie was made with the best of intentions. Of course they were trying to make a brighter, funnier DC movie to move away from the Snyderverse because they thought that's what audiences wanted. Now... The movie only made 300 million, but the reviews were good. It cost nothing to make, basically, in terms of other movies, and it made a healthy profit. But this movie didn't make a profit because it dumbed down. It wasn't the movie. It was a bad impression of the first movie. If you have Mark Strong, he's going to demand a better script because he's a really good, you know, really trained British actor. He was brilliant. In the, he was the only brilliant thing, again, in the Green Lantern movie. His Sinestro really, really worked. Personally, I'd love to see him as Sinestro again. There were rumours in the original Green Lantern core series they were going to do on HBO Max. They were going to use Mark Strong again. That's what I heard. But 
And James Gunn would be well served to use him in a Green Lantern show because he was a great Sinestro. He reminded me of the comic book Sinestro. But, you know, you started this villain journey. Continue it in the sequel. Continue Shazam's story and the Shazam's family's story. Of course, in the first film, it focused on, you know, Freddy and, and Shazam himself, right? Billy Batson. It didn't, you had the other family members there, but they didn't need to be forced into the story. Because in the first film, he, he gave them the powers, right? He, you know, they kind of felt that you needed the whole family to be catalogued in this movie. And I think that's another reason the movie doesn't work one little bit. So this is where they got it wrong. And they really just made a very, very lazy, lazily overstuffed movie. And that's why... It didn't work. I don't hate Shazam Fury of the Gods. I don't dislike David F. Sandberg. I dislike his attitude on social media once he knew the film had been voted down by verified critics and some fans. You know, I don't like the crybaby antics of Rachel Zegler and David F. Sandberg. I don't like that attitude. This is the only industry that gets away with selling you moldy cheese. It's a consumer-based industry and they're so arrogant, they don't realise that the, the, that the consumer is running the show and not them. And they cry like babies, they can't take criticism, they call their customers, us, toxic fandoms. No, it's just the customer and your client complaining that you sold us mouldy cheese. That's my analogy there. So, yeah, I would have loved to have seen Dr. Savannah play a bigger role in the film and Mr. Mind. And guess fucking else why? Guess why else I would like that? Because you teased it in a post credit scene in the first movie. So that's what we should have got. It's not rocket science, everyone, is it? You teased that. That was the better option. There was no need to go in another direction. Why tease it and then not do it? But then, because we complained about you not doing it, you fucking stuck a finger at us and put them in a post credit scene and made a fucking joke of them. It's not funny to abuse your customers. Basically, you're driving us away. This is the problem because you, you're so arrogant. You can't take any criticism. And this is why your movie failed. With Superman Legacy written and directed by James Gunn, now in active development and in pre-production and they're talking about you know getting into the casting of Superman and the other characters very soon I want to ask the question today what does it take to make a great Superman movie is there a formula or are there different formulas well let's start with Man of Steel Man of Steel almost had a two billion dollar movie I mean it you can laugh at me because if that movie just cuts some of some of the over destruction again i don't mind anything about man of steel but i talk i look at the complaints about the movie if they just took out some of the you know the destruction i mean i love the special effects i love the explosions i love it i love the fights you know it, it's great i don't have an issue with any of it but i believe if they take out some of the destruction and you know don't have sequences where superman's pushing Zod into a petrol station that explodes and probably kills some people. If they kind of took those elements out of it and didn't have Superman breaking Zod's neck and Zod just ends up in the Phantom Zone after a little fight with Supes, I think that movie makes a lot of money. Man of Steel wasn't far away from being, I think it's a great Superman movie, as it is. But the general audience and families and children have to be able to come and see these movies and there were certain issues with the movie which we've discussed before which made it unplausible for children and families to go back weekend after weekend after weekend and watch this movie and make it more money cut out the breaking of Zod's neck by Superman break up you know cut out some of the destruction cut out some other things and basically you've got a surefire billion two billion dollar movie definitely i think that basically man still wasn't far away from being for general audiences the ultimate superman movie it's got a great director 
It's got two great writers in, you know, Goyer and Nolan, right, who did the Dark Knight trilogy perfectly. All they had to do is rein in some of their ideas. And you'll say, well, why should they, you know, why should they, you know, amp down their creative vision? I agree with you. It's not about me. It ain't about you. It's about making enough money so you can do your Dark Knight, right? Because Man of Steel had certain complaints, people were going to go for BVS. BVS, BVS didn't earn the right to be BVS, because in the general audience's mind, the first film had issues. Do you get it? Batman Begins made barely $400 million at the global box office, but it was a cheaply made film and it made a big profit. People liked Batman Begins. Some people even preferred Batman Begins to The Dark Knight. But Batman Begins earned the right to make The Dark Knight. If people had issues with Batman Begins, then The Dark Knight would have been as maligned as Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. As maligned and as divisive. It's all about your first movie. When you make a good first movie, you can get away with having a bigger vision. That's not necessarily having to please the general audience. Everyone came in for The Dark Knight. Most people loved The Dark Knight. It worked. Now, there's some other factors why The Dark Knight was beloved. And I have to be honest, and people are not going to like hearing this, but Heath Ledger's death really helped sell that movie even more. And we all know that. It was a fantastic performance. But his death did put more butts than seats. Now, that's an untasteful and unseemly thing to say, but it's the truth. But I think if Man of Steel cut out some things, it would have made a lot of money, which means Henry comes back for his Man of Steel 2 straight away, like Robert Downey Jr. came back for Iron Man 2, which is a terrible movie, by the way. They made a first great movie, but the second movie wasn't good. I found it very, very boring. But this is what happened with Man of Steel. So Man of Steel, is nearly the movie that is it's a contemporary movie, could have made a lot of money, but sometimes you have to dial a few things back, right? You have to, some you can't always get everything you want in life, but they made the movie they wanted to make, and it's a great movie, but you've got to think of the business side as well. So Man of Steel wasn't too far away from being basically a huge hit, because there's nothing wrong with it, really. There's nothing. It's a great movie, it's a great Superman movie. It's not the Superman we grew up with. It's not the Superman we've read in a lot of comics, but he's a contemporary Superman. And it works for a contemporary audience, right? Because just under 700 million isn't bad for an origin movie, but for Superman, you know, you've got to be making more money than that. And it's a shame. But just because they didn't make $2 billion, it doesn't mean Man of Steel isn't a good film. And I think Man of Steel is going to be haunting Superman Legacy throughout its release. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I am wrong. I'm not one of these people who wants James Gunn to actually fail. I just have some, I just question the decision to put him in charge of this movie. And as I keep on saying, and I know I'm boring, putting him in charge of DC Universe. But anyway, it is what it is. So what do I feel makes the perfect Superman movie? Well, a perfect Superman movie, a Superman movie that sells, and is brilliant and is enjoyable to me, a huge Superman fan. Uh, first of all, he has, basically the world has to feel like Superman's world. So as a small kid, I'm watching the planet Krypton. Now, in Dick Donner's movie, they could only basically have inside scenes of Krypton. So you don't have the vast stunning VFX we got in Man of Steel because they didn't have that technology. But basically, Dick Donner's team created this beautiful kind of ice planet and it looks great for the time and it's all built it's all miniatures right which the camera enlarges it's stunning for the time it looks like the kind of planet superman may come from then we go to smallville you know it, it's it, this small country town it works it's believable the actor who plays young clark is great of course they dubbed over christopher reeve's voice over him for me personally, Christopher Reeve should have played young Clark Kent. Chris was about 24 years old. Henry Cavill plays young Clark Kent in the Smallville flashbacks. They should have done the same then. 
But don't get me wrong, the actor they used was great. But if you're going to dub your voice, the main Superman actor's voice over him, what's the freaking point? And so the thing is with a Superman movie, everyone has an idea. That's why I said earlier, everyone's got different ideas what makes a great Superman movie. It's got to be visually stunning. You know, when you see him fly, you've got to believe he's flying. When he's using his powers, it's got to look convincing. So, you know, visu you know, visually, it's got to be great. Now, for me, Man of Steel, visually, is light years ahead of anything that I see today. Maybe the Dune movie by Denis Villeneuve, you know, equals the kind of VFX and cinematography we saw in Man of Steel. But Man of Steel's VFX isn't, doesn't feel like 2013 effects. They feel like 2026 effects. We're not even in 2026 yet. That's what I mean. So basically, when you watch Man of Steel and you see that VFX, when I was sitting in the cinema, I was stunned. I'd never seen a movie where I didn't think I was looking at CGI or VFX. It felt real. When those buildings are falling down, it looks sensational. And when they're all running away from the buildings, right? When, you know, what's her name? You know, um, what's, what's her name? I forgot her name now. The, the female Jimmy Olsen, right? Let's call her the female Jimmy Olsen. She's running away. You can see the building. It's stunning. So this is why Man of Steel is literally the perfect contemporary Superman movie. Good luck, James Gunn. I don't think James Gunn can do cinematography like Zack did. But it's all about the story. But I like the Man of Steel. I love the Man of Steel story as well. You've got to create a great story for Superman to be in. Because you've got to think about what works for Superman. So in Superman Returns, he fought Lex Luthor. And he had yet another plan to have land and all of that using Kryptonian technology. Man of Steel, basically, um, it was an extraterrestrial threat with Zod. Um, I've said this a lot, and my Superman story is about Metallo and Manchester Black, because basically it's a domestic story. You know, Metallo is a human being. You know, he ends up dying and, you know, being brought back with a, you know, a kryptonite heart. But ultimately, you know, the John Corbin version which Smallville did really, really well. I thought Brian Austin Green as Metallo in Smallville was excellent. I think Metallo is a domestic threat, but you can also humanise him. I think I've seen too many alien threats in CBMs lately. And I think it's time for a good domestic threat for Superman. Manchester Black is a great threat for Superman. And so is, you know, John Corbin's Metallo. Both human beings with abilities, with strength, it would work. And you've got the emotional story there as well. So I would like to see a domestic, you know, enemy that's still got abilities and powers because you are fighting Superman. So you need people who are strong, that have abilities and things like that. Now, someone having a kryptonite heart really messes Superman up. And he has to find different ways and techniques to kind of protect himself from that. That's another reason why Metallo is great. I think the last thing we need is another alien threat. The MCU keep on doing it. You know, we've had a lot with the DC, you know, with the DCEU as well. I think a domestic threat. So I, I would like to see domestic villains like, like Metallo and like Manchester Black and the Elite. It doesn't have to be them, but something along those lines. Now, Bizarro would be really interesting. Now, Superman and Lois have nailed the bizarro character. So, you know, James Gunn will be under a lot of pressure there. So it's going to be interesting. But with all the leaks and teases that James Gunn's giving us, we could be getting Superman versus the authority. Now, a lot of people don't like that idea. I think I'm not going to dismiss that idea, even though, I, you know, I'm a bit sceptical about James Gunn writing and directing a Superman movie. I think the authority could be really good. Because a lot of those characters do have abilities. They are strong. It could work. And the themes that James is looking to use with the authority, right? And I think they're interesting themes, could work for a Superman movie. I don't know if they're going to build out this authority, this authority versus the Justice League or the Justice Society. Maybe it's not something that plays out in Superman Legacy. We'll have to wait and see. But I don't mind the authority versus Superman. Not that I know much about the authority anyway. I'm not going to lie and tell you I'm an expert on the authority. James Gunn certainly knows leaps and bounds more about the authority 
than I do. I've read up on them a bit ever since I heard he's going to be using them in the DC Universe. But yeah, what makes a perfect Superman movie is that you have to feel, you have to like Superman, you have to feel he's a good guy that you could turn to. Basically, it's what Christopher Reeve said in an interview. He's a friend. And I think that's the most important thing. If he feels like this pure friend that you could approach any time, that Jimmy Olsen could have as a best pal, then you've got something special. Because if you like Superman, you can do anything with him in the storytelling. And then he's a guy that Lois Lane can fall in love with. And how do you get Lois Lane right? Now, there's, especially with modern day New Hollywood, there's this temptation to make Lois a bit of a bitch, a bit of a feminist. You've got to be careful. Lois Lane is a capable, strong woman. But you've got to remember, she's a compassionate woman. She's a reporter because she cares about the world she lives in. She wants to expose the Lex Luthers and the Maxwell Lords of this world. And other people. She cares. She cares about people. She has compassion. Basically, she's Superman in, in the sense of being a journalist. She uses her journalistic abilities to expose wrongdoings. So she's got to be strong. She's got to be forthright. But she can't be a bitch. So I think that like Margot Kidder's version is great. Some people don't like her because they feel she's only with Superman because he's Superman. I mean, Erica Durant's Superman is probably the best live action Lois Lane as far as I'm concerned. But you've got to get the whole package right. Then you've got Perry White. Yet I think Jackie Cooper in the Dick Donner movie, in the Christopher Reeve movies, was absolutely perfect casting. And they cast him by accident because the original actor had a heart attack. And so that's how Jackie Cooper got involved. But he was brilliant. You know, you've got Lane Smith in Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. He was a great Perry White. And most importantly, Lex Luthor is a big part of the Superman universe. He doesn't have to be the main villain. That's not the point. But he has to be there. He has to be that guy pulling the strings from the background, being that big businessman, that titan. But he doesn't have to be the main villain because a lot of people don't want him to be the main villain. So there's lots of different ways of making the perfect Superman movie. I think what I've found from this discussion is that there's no one way to make a perfect Superman movie. But I think the audience have told us that they don't want depth, that they don't want the hero's journey like Zack Snyder was attempting to do. Something deep and interesting. The, audience, the general audiences are telling us that they just want something that goes on for two, two and a half hours, which is a little bit funny, a little bit emotional, with a little bit of action. Which is sad, really, because I like what Zack Snyder did. I like the story he began to tell in Man of Steel about Clark's hero's journey. The Snyderverse is Clark's story. Clark's hero's journey. And it's a shame that never played out. This has been Sunday's edition of the DC Universe Daily. With me, Mick, your host with the most just asked your girlfriends and your wife. Please like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you never miss this beautiful perfection. And I'll see you again in the next video. Until I see you again, goodbye, au revoir, au fidesz.